Hi, Vintage Carters. This is Steve Welty. You know, vintage carding can mean a lot of things to different people. For some people, it's about finding that old piece of junk and restoring it, making it look beautiful. They find something that's 50 years old. They want it to be perfect, just like it was when it was new. For us, it's a little bit different. Yes, we have a couple original vintage carts, but for us, it's about we want to hit the racetrack. And to do that the best we possibly can, it's about taking a chassis that's not all worn out, bent up, and fatigued, and going to the track with the best possible piece of equipment we can. So in that regard, we intend to build our own. And we're going to show you a little bit of that process and go through it, and you'll see pretty much what this is about from start to finish. One of the first things you want to do is select your material. You can use, in this case we're using one inch material, you can select chrome molly or you can select mild steel. You could use DOM, but in this case we're using mild steel that's electric weld tubing, ERW. Now, you can use 83 wall if you want. Uh, be sure and check your wall thickness because the quality of the tubing is not all the same. Sometimes when you get 83, you'll find out it's 76. In this case, I'm using 95 wall, and you say, why use 95? Isn't that overkill? Well, not really, because it actually ends up being 90 thousandths, and instead of using 83 wall, we're using this only on the outer perimeter of the frame, so we're only having about a pound and a half difference in overall cart weight by using the 95 tubing uh, versus the 83. It's winter time in Wisconsin. This is the time of the year that we build things. Now when there's snow on the ground or it freezes up and I'm not going to be outside with the carts, it's time to make something for next year. In this case we're going to get ready to build a new chassis. I'm going to take this piece of tubing, it's going to become the main rails. I've already built a bunch of these so I pretty much know what I'm doing. I use a JD2 tubing bender. It's got a one inch die in it. Uh, it's all set up, so basically all we do is put it in place. It bends easy enough that I could bend it with two fingers. That's how easy this tubing bender is to use. Now if you're going to do what I do, believe me, you're going to go through a bunch of tubing before you figure out how to make this frame, so don't practice with your best tubing because you're going to ruin all of it. So we're going to get started here. There, I just finished my last bend on a one-piece perimeter frame. It's not too easy to do. It takes a lot of practice. Uh, if you really didn't see me do it, that's because I'm freaky fast, kind of like Jimmy John's. So, uh, that was fast. Okay, I just finished the bend on the front axle. Uh, you can see my bend marks on here. Got the center mark, which tells us where we want this bent. Uh, I might notice I don't have a protractor on my tubing bender because I don't use one because I take it on and off all the time. If I'm going to use a protractor, it's going to always be bent and have to be reset. What I've done is I've marked every one of these notches with a number, and I can keep track of the numbers on how many poles of notches I use to make each bend. makes it a lot simpler for me where I have to remove this all the time. Here I've just finished bending the seat, rear seat hoop on an alley cat. Just put the last bends in that. Now you want to get all your parts all bent up. After you have your main rails bent, get everything else collected. This actually goes pretty fast. I can bend, uh, I can bend up a couple of these in a morning without any problem. Uh, then the hard part comes all the welding and fitting it together, but that's not that bad either. We've been busy bending up pieces of tubing here. As you can see, we've bent up front bumper, rear seat hoops, we got the steering hoops bent up. Uh, get all this stuff all ready the way you want it after you figure out how you want it. And uh, your assembly project on your car will go pretty fast. Now you can think what you want. This is a high tech jig. The intent is not to build a thousand of these. This is a simple jig. That allows you to build a half a dozen go-karts or one if you want. Uh, probably not going to be good long term to build 100 carts on, but you know what? There's not 100 people to buy them, so we don't worry about it. 
Uh, I can't say we're not successful because I think we've proven that our chassis run with the best of anybody. So this is this is a basic setup. What we do. This frame, the rails have not been tweaked the last little bit to get everything exactly where we want them, but we're really, really close. This is exactly the way it came out of the bender. So as you can see, I have a place here for my front axle to bolt to. Uh, rear axle is going to lay in here, is where the rear axle is going to be. Uh, the seat tubes, I'll grab a seat tube here. Seat tubes can actually end up getting put in, put in right here. Uh, we use an angle finder. I have a, I have a mount that holds this in position. I put an angle finder on it. Just an uh, inexpensive dial angle finder. I don't use the digital stuff because the batteries are always dead. Um, and then when we get this, we get the front end all tied in. We can weld all these pieces in place so you can kind of see how things go together. All right, this is going to be your front axle jig. Uh, you want to make one out of steel if you're going to make more than one axle. Otherwise, it could be made out of wood with uh, steel pieces to hold it down. Uh, I make more than one axle, so I've made mine out of steel. You drop your hangers in here, drop a bolt through them, cut your axle to length. Uh, I use a bandsaw on a lot of my cuts, but I also use an ang four and a half inch angle head on a lot of the cuts. And all my fish mouth uh, cuts, I actually use a flap wheel and a four and a half inch grinder because it's easier to take that tiny little bit off of it. And this thin wall tubing, you do a fish mouth in 30 seconds. So it's actually faster than using a regular fish mouth cutter. I just drop the front axle in place. It's the way I hold mine in place once I figure out how many degrees I want everything. Obviously you already set the kingpin angle, so now this is just holding caster where you want it. Get this frame tweaked out where you want it. Uh, figure out what your length is. I have this is also made to do a two inch stretch or a standard length chassis all on the same board here. Uh, I'm holding this up in the back, but normally you'd be cutting that off up there and it would sit right here. You're able to weld this all together. Once you get the front axle welded in and where you want the rear end of it, and it's got a center line marked all the way down through here so everything's on center, uh, weld, it, weld it up, then you're ready to weld your axle plates on. I just slid a axle in there with the hanger and the bearing and in place so you can uh, see how that goes together. Uh, gotta remember guys, this is a go-kart. This is simple stuff. Um, also al almost makes restoration cheating, but I'd rather start from scratch. Um, and you, you might say, well you're showing us how to do all this from scratch kinda, but uh, you know maybe maybe that's a secret, but it's really not a secret. It's vintage carding. There aren't any secrets supposedly in vintage carding, so here you go. This is how it's done. Um, besides that, it's a fun project, and, and fabrication can take you a lot of places in the country, you know. Uh, in your whole life, you can spend fabricating. Uh, it's just a fun thing to do, and, and I love to fabricate, so for me, I'd rather start from scratch. Got one of our alley cat frames here all in place. Uh, it's a little bit different once you get all the tabs and everything in place. Things don't always line up where, right where you'd like them to drop into. Um, I always brace this front axle like this because so many of the frames have had the front axle bent. And if you put this brace in here, Believe me, you're going to have to hit a brick wall to bend this front axle. You might bend a hanger bracket, but you're not bending this front axle. Um, it's just foolish not to put that in there from the beginning. We've got everything on this frame all welded together. On the single engine carts, I weld the, the brake hanger on the inside of the frame so the brake's sitting in here so that, that you can't have the brake damaged if you have an impact out here on the outside. 
On the dual chassis, I run a tube down through the metal and the brake gets mounted right here. Uh, so, there's a little difference in the way I do things. Um, this has a drop-in seat pan. I finally decided that instead of all the rivets, why not put additional tabs on here to hold that seat pan in place so it can never drop out. I've seen too many broken rivets over the years. Have two completed chassis here. This one's a dual. It's got the center bar in it. Front bumper is a little different. This is a single chassis for single engine. Uh, it's about 250 welds per chassis, so you're going to do a lot of welding. Um, and that's figuring that you have to weld across the top, flip the thing over, and weld on the bottom. Uh, so it's a lot of welds. Uh, Start to finish, if you work eight hours a day, uh, one guy, he's going to work, you're going to work uh, probably about 30 hours just to get to this point. Uh, and I know your restorer guys are going to say, hey, that's pretty fast. Well, you know, really it is, uh, because I'm starting with all straight stuff. I don't have to cut things out, put things back in. I only have to do it one time. We do a lot of different things in our shop. As you can see, we don't have a big fancy shop. We basically build these carts and build the motorcycles in a one-stall garage. Uh, this is a 1979 shovel head we're working on here. Uh, in our other stall, which is bigger, uh, we got Sean's 51 Ford Street Rod project we're working on. Uh, this will be rolling out of here this spring. But uh, yeah, no big fancy shop. It's not about how many tools you have or how much money you spend. It's your ability to be able to work with what you have. If you don't know how to do anything, you're kind of screwed.